Yeah, brief history. So these are GLP-1 agonists, receptor agonists. GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptide 1. And the history of these is really interesting in the 1950s or 60s. They were trying to look at insulin response to a glucose load via intravenous versus orally. Ingesting it had a larger insulin response. And what they thought was that there's something in the GI tract. They, they called it the incretin effect intestinal secretion of insulin. It wasn't until later, actually one of someone who I really look up to, Dr. Dan Drucker in the 1980s, he's one of the main people that kind of discovered one of the yeah. incretins. There's a few incretins, but GLP-1 was one of them. The saliva of these Gila monsters, these little lizards, they found that there is some homology, a very similar structure of GLP-1 in their saliva. These really smart researchers and scientists figured out how to use this in humans. 2005, 2006, the first FDA approved drug. It was a twice a day medicine, Bietta, Exenatide. It was okay, it had a little bit of weight loss. Glycemic benefits were there. Researchers start looking into, okay, how do we make this last a little bit longer? So then out came Victoza, which is liraglutide, and that was a once a day injection. Then they cranked up the dose of that. They put it up to three milligrams and studied it because people were noticing people are losing weight with this. We should study it not just for those with type 2 diabetes with glycemic issues, but those without glycemic issues and see if it can be useful for weight loss. Uh, and they knew that it was part of the physiology of appetite. It wasn't just, like, oh, by golly, this is cool. It's, no, they, they knew there, was appet there were appetite changes, so it wasn't, it wasn't like a big surprise or mistake. They knew there was some yeah. potential there, and they found that it was safe and actually pretty effective. 7 to 8% average body weight loss when they cranked it up to 3 milligrams. And that was Saxenda that got approved in 2014. Fast forward a few years, they figure out semaglutide. Semaglutide, instead of a once-daily injection, it's a once-weekly injection. So it lasts a lot longer. You can put in higher doses without making people nauseous. Certainly better for glycemic purposes. It got approved first as Ozempic in 2017, only a milligram of it at first, but then they cranked up the dose to 2.4 milligrams. And this is Wegovi. That was in 2021, around 15% average body weight loss. And now new trials. We knew it reduced cardiovascular events in those with type 2 diabetes, but now they're even studying it in those with cardiovascular disease and seeing decreases in heart attacks even without type 2 diabetes. Very interesting stuff. This was perfect, and I, I, I can't think of anybody else knowing about this, and, and it's such a beautiful succession of the news, so thank you for sharing that. Those are crazy numbers. I mean, that is very impressive. You said responders, which means that there are non-responders as well. Like There can be. In your experience with working with patients, what do they look like, and why are they non-responders? Yeah. I, I guarantee the drug companies are, are just chomping at the bit to figure this out too. Manjaro is technically for type 2 diabetes, but we use it a lot off-label for obesity. 2022, it got approved. The people that didn't respond to this one, 5% of people don't respond. And when I say don't respond, they're barely hitting 5% total body weight loss when the average is over 20%. They likely have some genetic thing. These are people that have had obesity since childhood. I started ordering like extensive genetics on some of these patients. I had this protocol where like other doctors working with me would send me these patients and I would do something where you can look at a lot of the genetic causes of obesity. There's a lot of things that fall under appetite. It's not just hunger. It's not just satiety. There's also cravings and there's also this food noise, intrusive, constant thoughts about food. So even if you're like full, you're not hungry, you're not even craving anything specifically. It's just thoughts about when are you going to eat? What are you going to do? And it's come to be known more because of these medicines, because people didn't even know they had that and they didn't know it was what I would consider pathological. Let's talk about some of the side effects and some of the scary yeah. things that we hear on a regular basis related to these medications. And you know, the first thing that comes to mind is gastrointestinal issues. Yeah. Um, could you touch on that? Yeah, so drugs have effects, right? Side effects, I would call those like unintended effects. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. The most common side effect is nausea, mild to moderate nausea, to the point where people have to come off. When you look at the randomized trials, it's fewer than 10%. I do like to stress the importance of this is why you start at the lowest dose, and I only go up if they're tolerating it. The next most common thing, you could say it's either constipation or reflux. Now, reflux is obvious. It's these medicines physiologically slow down gastric emptying, the amount of food stuff and liquid that is then released from the stomach into the intestines. So if you have more food stuff in there, there's more of a chance for it to reflux go up back through the esophagus. 
constipation, if you're slowing down gastric emptying and, and all that stuff, that, that could that can happen. But what I see is we can minimize that through the same stuff that we always do. High fiber foods, lots of water, lots of physical activity. Th those tend to minimize uh, and prevent the constipation or start improving it if you do develop it. The scary things that people talk about. First and foremost is the black box warning of thyroid cancer. There's a specific type of thyroid cancer called medullary thyroid cancer. The most common thyroid cancer we see is papillary thyroid cancer. Medullary thyroid cancer is a much rarer type. It's more aggressive than the papillary or follicular, but it's rare. There was a, an observational study released uh, a year ago. They showed, hey, look, there looks like there's an increased risk of people taking these medicines and thyroid cancer, and even this medullary thyroid cancer. Newer studies show, no, that's not the case. The big thing with these observational trials, you, you see what's called are biases. I'm not making excuses for the drug company. I swear I don't get paid by Big Pharma, but yeah, like I'm just trying to do good science here. I have patients that do this. Any little tickle in their throat, any little fullness in their throat, any little thing, and if they're taking these medicines, like I'm worried about thyroid cancer, can I get a, a thyroid ultrasound? And the clinician who's getting prompted by the patient that they feel fullness in their throat Imagine you saying no, and they might have something. So yeah. in this litigious world, doctors are going to send them for the thyroid ultrasound. The more you do thyroid ultrasounds, the more you're going to find stuff. It's called a detection bias. I think it should continue to be studied, but in, in all the randomized control trials, even the longer ones, there was no detection, especially that select trial that was huge, thousands. And in the meta-analyses, they have not found it in the randomized trials. Now, let's get into pancreatitis. So yes. that's a big worry. Initially with exanatide bieta, these drugs, part of their mechanism that people thought were good for type 2 diabetes is that there may be some beta cell preservation. So with type 2 diabetes, your pancreas starts burning out and it's part of the reason your blood sugars start going up. So not just insulin resistance, but the pancreas itself can't release as much insulin. So with these drugs, they may actually stabilize it, but there was worry because they work at the pancreatic level that there might be changes going on and may give a rise to inflammation and pancreatitis. There was a big worry about it, but in all the randomized controlled trials, they've done meta-analyses, no statistically significant difference compared to placebo. The one signal that we see commonly is gallbladder disease, meaning gallstones, which can then lead to cholecystitis. Inflammation of the gallbladder can be very dangerous. Another complication of gallbladder disease and gallstones is the gallstone can get where the pancreas is and cause inflammation and cause pancreatitis. That's one of the major causes of pancreatitis. The one thing that I would counsel patients on is that there's potential for developing gallstones and gallbladder disease. It's one of the reasons why I try not to titrate people up too quickly either if they're losing weight rapidly. Once you start losing around 1% or more of your percent of average body weight per week, it puts you at risk for gallstone formation. You basically start changing the mixture of your bile and it can increase the risk of forming stones. The other one you'll hear about are stomach paralysis. Yeah, So we hear that a lot. Yeah, so interestingly enough, these medicines, like they absolutely slow down gastric emptying. If you're not releasing food into the intestines, you're not getting food that can be the sugars that are absorbed, so you, you don't see as quickly of a rise of blood sugar. For weight loss, maybe it helps with the filling effect, but actually over time, the that effect, the gastric emptying, actually wanes. You see a faster gastric emptying the longer you've been on the medicine. I have yet to see anything that's permanent. There's nothing in the randomized controlled trials. What's possible it happens has to be pretty rare though. Let's jump back to the cardiovascular benefits of semaglutide and studies that it can reduce the risk of cardiovascular events like heart attack and stroke. Can you touch on that? Yeah, Victoza type 2 diabetes, 1.8 milligrams. That was like the first one to look at like in type 2 diabetes. Whoa, these drugs aren't just reducing glycemic events. This was the first one where they found like macrovascular reduction in, in heart events. We know that antihyperglycemic medicines aren't always cardioprotective. So what else is going on here? Throughout the years, there have been more of those cardiovascular outcome trials in type 2 diabetes. The SELECT trial, which just came out this past year in 2023 in November, that was in obesity and cardiovascular disease, no type 2 diabetes. So these are people with a history of some sort of history of cardiovascular disease, angina, prior heart attacks, those types of things. That one showed very clearly that, wow, the people in the placebo group was up high, whereas the, the people the, on the drug were down low, meaning they were getting fewer and fewer events very quickly. And this was thousands of patients 
and over the course of four years, and that's important because people don't think that there are long-term trials on these medicines. Four years is a long and a huge trial. In Hollywood, and you see all these celebrities, the Kardashians, Kelly Clarkson, it's become more of like a celebrity kind of a medication. I think that's one of the reasons why there is a lot of discomfort among general population to be able to use such a medication for health and wellness and longevity as opposed to vanity. One of the other things that I come across with my patients and in, in the communities that we work with is there's a sense of blame and shame associated with not being able to lose weight. You have to know that there is no blame you know even for some of the most intelligent people health aware and health literate people weight loss is one of the most difficult things because it's not just a decision to eat something or not eat something it's your history it's your environment it's your family it's your mental health issues it's your socioeconomic status at this time of this recording maybe in a few years if you're listening to this it won't be an issue. The supply chain is so constrained. Yeah. I don't even know how they didn't foresee this, but they're, these are multi-billion dollar companies, almost trillion dollar companies that didn't apparently prepare for this supply chain issue. We, we can barely, we, we can't keep up even for those who truly need it and where it's, we know it's beneficial. So if you're in Hollywood, they're going to have their concierge doctors. They're going to get the medicine somehow. Now you are making it very difficult for the supply chain for those who like will have major clinical benefit. So I strongly recommend against that practice. Yeah. The paradigm shift is now thinking of the biology of obesity a little bit more. We know the mental aspect, like you said, all the socioeconomic stuff. Even like the some of the richest people, the smartest, richest people uh, with all the resources in the world still can struggle with their weight. People are like, oh, people are going to take these drugs and just eat donuts all day and just lose weight. Sure, I suppose that could happen. In my experience, what I see is that the drugs actually help people do what they already have a semblance idea of what to do. There's a lot of people that know what to do. They simply cannot do it for whatever reason. And I will say that for the major reason, it's biological driver. This biological agent hits the receptors in the brain. All of a sudden it's like, oh wow, I can actually not have that second helping. I can actually skip the dessert. I already knew I wasn't, yeah. didn't want that, but I'd always eat it. Now I don't, I don't have to. That's essentially how they work. They're not like, again, they're not these magical fat burners. They just help people do the things that are conducive for losing weight and keeping off. <laughs>